trying to stay pain free and athletic? This is something that everyone wants, but out of millions of exercises that you can choose from, choosing the right ones will determine the quality of life and success of your athletic career. This leads us to the Fascia Research Congress 2022 meeting in Montreal, Canada. There are a small group of scientists started to realize the autonomy we have disregarded for decades, the fascia network of the human body. It is through these researches do we make sense of fascial training and the exercise that we do. What's going on guys? This is Coach Chong. In this video, I'm going to show you some thought-provoking fascia discoveries and incredible people behind these researches. It was early morning flight. I wanted to get to the airport as early as possible to beat the traffic. I've been to Montreal before for a family gathering, so this is not something new. But I was daydreaming all the new people that I will be meeting at the Congress meeting. Canada Air was a pleasant flight. It only took one hour or so from New York to Montreal. I entered my meditative state on the plane, and the next thing I know, I was already at the destination. I took an Uber ride to the hotel where the event is hosted. I settled in and set up my little booth, and I was conveniently placed next to Dr. Antonio Stekhov's booth. We had a decent conversation about his work and my insight into fascia training. Later that afternoon, I met a founder of Richelli's Therapy from Spain, who is a very down-to-earth person. We shared many interesting stories of how we work with fascia. Later, I also found out that he knew one of the athletes I worked with in Spain, Mark. The world is such a small place. The first day is about paying tribute to Dr. Thomas Finley, who passed away on April 18, 2021. Dr. Thomas was an MD-PhD who devoted his life to learning and teaching others about the human body and fascia. In his final years, he focused his research on integrative medicine, particularly fascia and extracellular matrix, and its role in manual therapies and potential role in oncology treatment. Then we started with Dr. Mark Driscoll's presentation on spine and how intra-abdominal pressure helps with stabilization of the spine. One of the discussion I brought up is how exactly to increase intra-abdominal pressure physically. Is it breathing through muscles or through other fascial means. During the presentation, he revealed that he had a lower back pain, which resulted from an ankle injury sustained during hockey. I explained to him that the ankle sprain is never innocent, and how the fascial connection from the feet to the glutes plays a significant role to lower back pain. We'll see where this takes us. After the presentation, I had a wonderful discussion with Dr. Robert Schlein in regards to what percentage of gluteal fascia is found during dissection. The latest research data shows about 80%. In other words, as the fascia provides the container for the glutes, without proper innovation to the glutes, the function will not be optimal. This is where we are different from mainstream approach on how to strengthen the glutes. Up next, it was Dr. Carla Steckel. I have to be completely frank, I did not understand her completely. However, I had the opportunity after to have a discussion with her regarding her fascial research. One thing she noticed, which was very interesting to me, was that having large amount of hyaluronic acid at the site of chronic elbow tendinitis, which is fascinating. This means having too much hyaluronic acid might not be a good thing. Perhaps having the inactivity of stagnant fascia is blocking the flow of hyaluronium. 
and making it trapped. The lunch and networking time was awesome. I made a few new friends. One of them is Bridget Hunter Jones, founder of Pact, which is a Bluetooth device that measures muscle tone, stiffness, and dampening rate. This is interesting because I was already aware of Mileton Tool, and this device seems to be less pricier version of the Mileton Tool. Why is this too important? Because fascial adhesions will make stiffer muscles, and if you can qualify it and detect early, you could prevent muscle or soft tissue injuries. Also, a difference of more than 10% would be used as an indication of muscle asymmetry. Quantitative assessment of myofascial tissue indicate the progress of muscle recovery from an injury. After lunch, it was Dr. Helen Lajevin. I was already aware of her research on fascia and back pain, acupuncture and fascia, and the effect of stretching on fascia in oncology. I had high expectations for her presentation. However, I was a little bit disappointed that the presentation given was the same one that I have learned years ago. Nevertheless, we had a little discussion afterwards and exchanged pleasantries. In the evening. We visited the FRRA room, or Freya. Unfortunately, I could not show you guys this part of the exhibition, that is prohibited from video or photograph. I was amazed to see many plastination models of the fascia compartments, and how it really functions with muscle, tendon, and nerves. So it is very clear to me how much the mainstream autonomy ignored. A good twenty percent of it. I met Mr. Whiteside from Atomonic Excellence, who provides this type of fascia dissection work and models. Perhaps in the future, you could see a fascia model in my office. At night, we went out and had Japanese ramen. One of the interesting thing about restaurant in Montreal is that they close early. As someone who lives in the city that never sleeps, I'm not used to it. And I also, they ask me if I want to split the check, which is quite unusual for a New Yorker. I always pay the tab, at least in my good memory. The second day lineup is full of intellectual delight. For me, it was like a kid in a candy store. Non-stop stimulation for my brain. And my fascia taste buds. First presentation was by Dr. Peter Frey. He is a German doctor on cancer cell migration and fascia, with 142 publications. There are many beautifully colored images of melanoma, and how it forms, develops, and spreads. He also demonstrated how these cancer cells spread through fascia channels or conduit. Which is a transparent structure, like the grids on the Google map. The biggest shocker it was when he demonstrated, with live video footage, how you can spread this type of cancer cells through manual therapy or massage. You have to understand, majority of the people attended the conference were consist of manual therapists, and Thomas Myers immediately asked the question, "How far away should you massage the tissue?" So it won't accelerate the spread of cancer cells. Doctor Peter Fred answer was very stern. He said, "That's a philosophical question. Why would you want to risk it?" Of course, his research is still ongoing, and we should use caution before jumping into conclusions what his experiment really means. But for me, the video demonstrated in vivo was pretty self-explanatory. During the Q&A session, Dr. Helen Lajevin raised interesting questions, as she was observing different cell migration behavior from her experiment on stretching. Afterwards, I joined in on this interesting discussion. It turned out two people from different places on Earth were researching the same thing, but using different cancer cells, different location of cancer cell insertion. Could these Provide a clue of why they are seeing different results. 
I've also listened to other clinicians chime in, arguing that Dr. Lajevin's stretching on mice experiment is not a true stretch. It is more like a hanging from a pull-up bar. Muscle might be in eccentric contraction. These were all valid points, in my opinion. I was really impressed by Dr. Peter Fred's presentation. I would say it was one of the best because it provided many video demonstrations of how cancer cells move in real time and spread through transparent fascia conduits, which were unidentified and unseen before. Shortly after, my booth was full of people asking me about how HFT would help with hypermobility, since we have good case studies on it, helping people with EDS. Then I was introduced to meet the inventor of Body Braid. I've seen many with hypermobility EDS make use of this exoskeleton of fascia, which helped support the structure of the body. I explained that the training of fascia through hyperarch fascial training is really making the internal fascial structure stronger. The third day of the conference, everyone became more acquainted with each other. It was Dr. Stuhl McGill's presentation on athletes and back pain. One of the things he said which surprised me was that the best athletes are not the strongest. His work are on back pain and on how fascia provides the stiffening container for the spine. That was very interesting. Some of the techniques he used, including pressing the obliques with both hands to increase pressure and pushing the tongue to the roof of the mouth. Someone in the audience quickly pointed out that this seems to be from Taoist or Qigong practice, which the good doctor admits. I have come to know Dr. McGill because of UFC fighter Mickey Gall. Mickey worked with Dr. McGill prior to working with me, and we all know how that went. Sayonara back pain, and hello to victory. Another interesting research was from Japan and it was on fascia thickness of older adults and comparison with bodybuilders. It turned out, deep fascia gets thicker as we age. Bodybuilders have thicker deep fascia than average men. Now, this begs the question, does this mean bodybuilders are more prone to fascia-related problems? We don't know for sure, but we do know is that muscle adaptation and development is quicker than fascia. Last but not the least, the winner of Finley Fellowship was announced, and that was Larissa Shinhorn from Brazil. Her presentation was exactly what I've been waiting for. As you probably know, my work on the hyperarch mechanism and its role in establishing superior fascial connection to the glutes from the feet, her experiments with mice demonstrated a relationship between the paw of the mice and their thoracolumbar fascia, or low back. When injected with cannabis into the paw of the mice, there are changes happening in the TLF. However, she couldn't identify through what type of communication this connection was made. At least, she explained to me it wasn't biochemical. There are other researches done on cupping and exercise, which are interesting. But due to length of the video, I will not include them here. If you learned from this video, please like and subscribe. Ask a good question below. Remember, once you go hyperarch, you never go back.